All right, welcome to Gospel Backgrounds Lesson 14. This one's called Master of the Sabbath. We're going to look at the first 14 verses of Matthew 12 and then the corresponding passages in Mark 2 and Luke 6. Even though this is only 14 verses, this is going to be a challenge, not because the material is necessarily hard, but because of our presupposition. So assuming that, like me, you have been taught that Jesus came to do away with the Sabbath, he came to replace the law, he came to uh, have a new religion, Christianity, displace Judaism, then that is what we're going to have to fight to overcome in this lesson. And I'm going to present some alternative viewpoints for your consideration here. So probably this one, more than any lesson that we've done so far, Acts 17.11 is definitely in play, if you will. Uh, it's where the Bereans received the word with all eagerness or all readiness of mind, yet they searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things were true. So more than ever, uh, we're going to present some things that maybe uh, I know I had never seen and read in detail like I did preparing for this, so I'm assuming it's going to be new for a lot of us. So we'll have to receive the word and then um, make sure it, it meshes and jives with what scripture says. All right, let's look at our topics for this lesson. First, we'll start with the accusation of Jesus' enemies. So they say he is not from God, and our evidence that he is not from God is because he's a Sabbath breaker. That should make all of us in the church who have gone along with the fact that Jesus is a Sabbath breaker, that should make us all very nervous because now we're on the sides of Jesus' enemies and the enemies say, because he does this, he's not from God. Jesus actually has a brilliantly simple defense. It was simple in his day. It's hard, harder to understand in our day, but we'll try to unpack it for you. Because of our presuppositions and the things that we've been taught, we tend to misinterpret these statements. One greater than the temple is here. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Um, we have those with our presuppositions. People who have looked at the context in more detail um, say that they don't mean what you think they mean. So we'll, we'll present those for you. And then again, all of this is I'm presenting this and you know I report, you decide kind of thing. And then finally, we'll close with the deep state has seen enough and they decree that Jesus needs to be taken out. So we have two major obstacles um, at this point. The uh, first is that we don't have this in-depth grasp of first century context. And that's what I'm trying to, in some way, um, provide here. I've got two main commentaries that I reference. So I use Daniel Lancaster, who's messianic, has a messianic Jewish background, and then Craig Keener, who's looked at more of the cultural, political, historical um, background. So I use primarily those two commentaries as well as others. But that is to help us kind of bridge the gap between the thousands of years and thousands of miles between us today in the 21st century and when these events happened a couple thousand years ago. And then the second is just the fact that me included, and I hope probably you too, anyone in the traditional church has been taught Judaism, bad, law, bad, Christianity, good, grace, good, grace and law are opposites. Um, grace and law aren't opposites. There's, there's mercy and grace running all throughout the sacrificial system. In fact, that's why it's there. So um, it, it's getting past that. And again, that anachronism that, that the, Jesus is talking about replacing the old Judaism with the new church kind of thing. Um, so getting past that uh, is, is, is another obstacle that we have to work through. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others, and I would say other Pharisees said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So first note that not all Pharisees think alike. They're not all bad, they're not all good, but uh, they don't, they're not one group. So again, John can be imprecise in, in his use of the term Pharisee. The second is that this first statement is, is not really wrong. If you are an observant Jew, let alone if you claim to be Messiah and you break the Sabbath, you can't be Messiah. You, you aren't from God. Um, you may as well have Jesus saying it's okay to murder or it's okay to dishonor your parents or it's okay to commit adultery. These are the Ten Commandments. Um, so you cannot be a Sabbath breaker and claim to be Messiah. In the absence of any legal exception, and I've got that in the middle of the screen there, that's key because that's going to be Jesus' point as we work through Matthew 12. Um, breaking the Sabbath is, is a, an extremely serious sin, and in, in certain forms it carries the death penalty. And there's a story in, um, in the Torah that has a man deliberately defying the rule, and, and he carries sticks, and uh, he's, he's put to death. 
So in the absence of a legal exception, breaking the Sabbath is a sin. So think about that. That's We need to think this through if we're going to call Jesus a Sabbath breaker. Um, accusing Jesus of committing a sin means he can't be my Savior because the only reason he can take my sins on is because he was sinless. So that is uh, that should get our attention, right? Because many Christians have taken the position of agreeing with Jesus' enemies that he came to do away with the Sabbath. And, and either they haven't thought through the implications or they haven't reconciled them or they've reconciled them incorrectly somehow. Um, so good news is we know Jesus is from God. He therefore is my savior. He therefore is the Jewish Messiah. And therefore he has to have kept the Sabbath. It's just non-negotiable. So our quest here, we've, we've got a couple of competing, uh, conflicting statements. So he is from God. He is the Messiah. He is our savior. Therefore, I'm telling you, he has to have kept the Sabbath. Um, he is not, he cannot be a Sabbath breaker and, and be all these things. Yet, we're conflicted, right? Because the Gospels appear to clearly portray Jesus and the disciples as violating Sabbath rules. So we have this episode of disciples plucking grain, and Jesus actually defends them. He heals all kinds of people on the Sabbath. He told a man to carry his mat, apparently in violation of the Sabbath. So what is going on here? Um, we've got these two problematic statements. So that is our quest to find out what's 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 actually happening here. And I talked about the two um, commentators that I lean on primarily for the service. I have others this uh, series, but um, the first is Lancaster. It comes from a Messianic Jewish perspective. He says Jesus' teaching actually upholds the legal observance of the Sabbath. So Jesus did not break any rules here. And Keener writes, Jesus is not overturning, but instead he demands a different way to understand and apply the Sabbath rules. So um, we're going to do something a little bit different with this lesson. I'm going to give you the answer first, and then we're going to go back and work the problem. And the answer is actually um, Daniel Lancaster's hypothesis. Um, we're going to give it to you first. It might be a little confusing to work through, but then as we read through the gospel passages, you can see for yourself whether this makes sense. So if you want to look at it, we're going to do Acts 17, 11 in real time. We're going to receive the teaching and then we're together, we're going to search the scriptures and, and see if it makes sense. What Jesus' argument is going to depend on is this overarching exception that says, if you are working on uh, preserving or rescuing life, then the Sabbath exceptions go out the window. And then what he what else he's going to do is he's, he is going to extend that to really any act of compassion, uh, which we see with the healings. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an emergency situation in Jesus' mind, but if you are furthering life, then you are exempt from, from the Sabbath restrictions. There's an analogy I thought of. Um, if, if the speed limit is 65 and I go 75, and I'm just in a hurry or I'm just not paying attention, then I really deserve to get a ticket. Um, I deserve to pay the fine. I just need to shut up and, and deal with it. If the speed limit is 65 and then along comes this van that's going 95, is that van breaking the law? What if that van has the word ambulance written across the side? What if that van has lights and sirens? You see what I'm saying? There's a, there's a medical emergency in place that is more important than the general need to have people drive at a safe speed. So there is that exception, and, and so that's that's an analogy. So maybe think of that as we work through this. And I'm sorry if you hate math, I'm sorry, but um, Lancaster believes that Jesus is employing a logical and a legal argument based on this very simple property called the transitive property of inequality. And we probably all learned this in junior high, and I'm, so I'm sorry if, if this is giving you flashbacks. But if A is greater than B and B is greater than C, then A is greater than C. And that's called the transitive property of inequality. And so Jesus is going to lay out in, in Matthew's version, he's going to lay out two different examples of where A is greater than B. And then the second one is going to be B is greater than C. He's going to turn around then and apply that to his disciples picking grain on the Sabbath. So I'm going to spell it out for you, and then we're going to go check it out in, in Matthew, and then at the end, you, you can draw your own conclusion. So human need is greater than the temple service. He'll, Jesus will tell a story about David taking forbidden temple bread when David and his men were hungry. 
Now, no one can normally walk into the temple and eat the bread. That was for the priests, and it had a very special purpose. But David's human need that they were starving superseded that rule. And uh, what's interesting is that this has nothing to do with the Sabbath at this point. Um, this was just any day of the week that the priests were in there. So David took the bread, So and that was deemed okay. David was not in violation of any rule. Um, he had a valid exception. The next half, temple service is greater than Sabbath restrictions. The priesthood, he Jesus talks about in Matthew, they violate the Sabbath every Saturday to carry out their prescribed work of, of lighting fires and uh, lighting candles and cleaning altars and, and all that. So then he's going to lay that out. Human need is greater than temple service. Temple service is greater than Sabbath restrictions. Therefore, the human need of his disciples being hungry supersedes the Sabbath restrictions that says you can't big grain. And that really is the nutshell of this argument. So like I said in the opening, it's simple because it's just the simple math formula that we all learned in the sixth or seventh grade. But yet we are not familiar enough with Jewish discourse to realize that this is what's going on, hopefully until today. So um, and after I, you know, I hadn't really dug into this before I started preparing for this lesson either. So anyway, that's the example. Now let's be Bereans and test this and see if it makes sense and come to our own conclusions. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and they began to pick pluck heads of grain to eat. And then Luke further says, rubbing them in their hands. And there's a, there's a reason Luke says that. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Um, like Lancaster, as again, maybe is his bias. He doesn't believe the Pharisees were there to entrap him because often it would say the Pharisees did this to entrap him. And we'll see this in the second half of our passage today where it, it says, you know, the Pharisees were testing Jesus or they wanted to set a trap for him. It doesn't say that here. So Matt, from that, Lancaster concludes that the Pharisees are just legitimate inquiry here. Um, Keener, on the other hand, says this is an example of the religious establishment and Jesus becoming com increasingly at odds. And it's going to conclude with, as I said, the deep state is, is going to go all in on the need to take Jesus out. So here's a beautiful picture of a grain field that's down in Judea. One thing is that um, the the fact that they could pluck heads of grain, and I don't know if it was wheat, it could be barley, um, but w whatever case, it was ready for harvest. Now, um, a couple of things. Normally, Pharisees wouldn't have any business on a grain field in, in the Sabbath. So they were there probably following Jesus around. Maybe they were learning from him or maybe they were taking notes on, on what he was doing. The, the second thing is you can't just willy-nilly walk on someone's field and steal their grain. Um, that's theft. So again, that takes us back to, is that what Jesus is doing? Well, I don't think so because Jesus was sinless. So uh, a thief can't die for my sins. Um, Jesus can die for the thief, and he did that, but it, it doesn't work the other way around. So um, the only exception is the law requiring uh, regarding gleaning. And so harvesters in that day were required to leave it's called the corner of your field you're supposed to leave that for the poor after you harvest it and then after you had made your pass then the poor anything you left the poor could come through and eat so probably that's what's going on here this is after the harvest of some time and uh then jesus disciples came through they were poor they're hungry and um and they came through and they plucked the grain So the Torah explicitly prohibits harvesting. And so this is probably why Luke adds rubbing them in their hands. So it's it's clear. The disciples are clearly uh, violating the Sabbath in this respect by harvesting. Um, rubbing their hands you know, is, is the same thing that, that machinery does nowadays, right? You're separating the, the seed from the husk. Um, so that's work. And um, so back to gleaning, I forgot to mention that the book of Ruth goes into much more detail. If you haven't read the book of Ruth, go read the book of Ruth um, because Ruth comes back and she's poor and then that's how she meets uh, Boaz and, and Boaz has actually just finished the harvest and uh, there's, there's a great story there. Okay, back to Matthew. Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor those who were with him, but only for the priests? Keener makes a comment that if Jesus could demonstrate his case from scripture, 
his opponents could technically not prosecute him. So, and, and he believes it's because the, the Jewish views on the matter were not established. Uh, there were differing views. So if you can make your case from scripture, yeah, you're good to go. We got, we will give you an exception here. So the story from 1 Samuel 21, what, what I have always missed about this is that it has nothing to do with the Sabbath. Um, Jesus is saying on any day of the week, doesn't even matter, that when Davis, David was hungry and his men were hungry, they did what was not lawful. They went into the temple and took the bread, but because they were starving, they had an, an approved exception. This is a representation of the showbread and it's in uh, the tabernacle uh, replica that is down way in the south of Israel, down by the, the Red Sea called uh, Timna Park. And uh, someday I wanna get there, it's, it's supposed to be pretty cool. Um, Jesus' response to this overall line of questioning is interesting. In other situations, when, when it's man's hedges that have gone too far, and, and some commentaries pick up that Jesus is rebelling against not the Sabbath, but he's, he's breaking man's rules. He doesn't say that here. Um, there was a scene, is a scene later about hand washing where he says that's that's your rule, that's not that's not God's rule, and he calls him out for it. So the, we've talked a little bit about hedges. It's probably worth just revisiting here real quickly. Um, hedges or fences, as they're called, they're things that man and woman, <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Man, put around a, a rule to make sure that the main rule doesn't get violated. So before we talked about how the Bible says don't be drunk. That's First First Corinthians six ten among other places. So um, the, a church they want to set a high moral standard. They don't want their members to be drunk. They impose a rule that members can't drink. So if members don't drink, then they won't get drunk. It's it's a simple. But but that is a hedge. That's a fence. The Bible doesn't say you can't drink. The Bible just says you can't be drunk. So if the hedge or the fence and not the law were the subject of of what's going on here, I think Jesus would have made that point, but he doesn't. Um, he talks about how David went into the tabernacle and, and ate the bread because he was hungry. And then this next section is only in Matthew, is uh, have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you something greater than the temple is here. So um, again, it's this is the Sabbath. So remember how in the story of David, we had human need being greater than the temple service. Now, this is the second part of the equation. Uh, temple service is greater than the Sabbath. So they were burning incense. They were uh, lighting fires, cleaning, all that kind of stuff. All technically violations that you're not supposed to do on the Sabbath. But because they're in the temple, um, they're, they have an, an approved exception. The sages say that whenever there are conflicting commands and one is a positive command that says do this and the other is a negative command that says don't do that, uh, this, let the positive supersede the negative. So the, the Sabbath command would say don't do work, but the positive command would say do the temple service. So in a way, uh, the, so the priests are violating the Sabbath by working, but they're guiltless because there's a higher rule that supersedes. So what I find interesting is that the Talmud, a couple of hundred years after um, the time of Jesus, records a nearly identical statement. So this is talking about a temple priest who is called to testify in a trial to the innocence of someone who is sentenced to death. And then the Talmud concludes, just as this priest is taken from the temple service in order to save a life, and temple service overrides the Sabbath, so too saving a life overrides Sabbath. So this could indicate that um, there was a lot of debate about this going on, and, and they there was some discussion about this. So maybe by the time of Jesus, maybe it could have been Jesus' words actually that led to this legal conclusion, which which I find fascinating. But it's this A is greater than B, B is greater than C, so A is greater than C. So saving a life overrides the Sabbath, and here it is written in the Talmud. So when Jesus says one greater than the temple is here, Lancaster then asserts that Jesus is talking about human need being greater than temple service. So the human need is what is greater than temple. Uh, it's, it's not that Jesus is coming to do away with any part of the Jewish law. And, and I realize this is an uphill battle to, to make this case because it's just been something that we've been taught for, you know, pretty much all my Christian life. 
I've heard that Jesus came to do away with the temple. He came to do away with the sacrifices. So, um, so it's it's hard. It's a hard sell. But uh, you know, just keep an open mind and and search the scriptures and come to your own conclusion. We talked a little bit about this quote, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, in um, a previous lesson. This is a quote from Hosea 6.6. 6, and, and I think a maybe a better paraphrase is, I desire grace, mercy, and loving kindness more than sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Um, but I, I'll be honest, that's not how the Hebrew reads, but I, I think it, it's a fit, especially when we look at Mark 12.23 which says, and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as ourselves is much more than all of the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So it's a matter of degree. Um, God is not saying that offerings are bad, but earnest desire of seeking him is better. And in the same way, I think what Jesus is saying here, concern for human beings and the alleviation of human suffering and in general, the promoting of life should always be placed ahead of ceremonial concerns. And so this fits well with Jesus' statement recorded in Mark that the Sabbath is made for man. The Sabbath is a blessing to man, but there are certain situations that, that need to be prioritized even over keeping the Sabbath. And the disciples' hunger was just one of those situations. For the Son of Man is Lord of a Sabbath. And, and here, um, the, the fact that the Son of Man is capitalized is part of the problem here. Um, it's easy to assume that Jesus used Son of Man as a messianic title, and we therefore can conclude that Jesus is pronouncing himself superior to the Sabbath rules. And, and on one level, of course he is. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. But again, back to our long discussion in the opening, if he came and did away with any of the laws, then he couldn't be a Jewish Messiah. In the same level, it would be totally inconsistent to say, for the Son of Man is Lord over adultery. So we're going to do away with the uh, restrictions on not committing adultery. Or the Son of Man is Lord of murder. So we're going to do away with the law that says do not commit murder. That is absurd. That's preposterous. We would never say that. And yet we're very comfortable saying Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, so we're going to do away with the Sabbath laws. That, that just a, messi a messiah wouldn't do that. There's just no chance. So um, Hebrew has a phrase that is a ben Adam, and that is, means literally son of Adam, but Adam is the word for man in, in a lot of cases. So it, it really means a generic son of man. If you remember the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, whether in the book or if you saw the movie, remember that the witch refers to Edmund as a son of Adam. Um, and that just means you're you're a human, <laughs> you're a human being. So um, again, th this is something that Keener picks up on. Jesus definitely has the right to interpret Sabbath rules as the authoritative Son of Man with capital letters um, as the Messiah. His opponents, no doubt, understood him to mean that because the Sabbath was made for people, uh, human beings had authority to do what they needed, uh, in implying to preserve life on the Sabbath. Son of man is a standard Aramaic term for human being, and his hearers probably assumed he meant this rather than he claimed to be the son of man of Daniel. So again, um, this is why I opened with John 9:16. His enemies called him a the one who did away with the Sabbath, and because of that, they said he's not from God. So he, it's it's just impossible that Jesus could have been implying that he's going to do away with the sabbath entirely and unfortunately that's what the church has picked up on so i, I think we need to uh we need to get that corrected so um we have to keep with conclusions that are consistent with what we know of jesus and his mission and we really need to check any part of our theology that that is inconsistent with jesus being the messiah so to try and put a bow on this this is Lancaster's conclusion on what Jesus is communicating. So the, the human being is Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for the human being, not to control human beings. Um, human beings take priority over the Sabbath. So just as compassion is greater than temple service, which is the David example, temple service is greater than the Shabbat requirements, which was the, uh, you know, the, the priest in the temple example. So therefore, compassion is greater than the Sabbath. 
And so when his disciples were hungry and they needed to eat and pluck grain on the Sabbath, they were allowed to do so. So I hope that made sense. Um, this is Lancaster's conclusion. And um, again, you, you read and, and make up your own mind. All right, we will move quickly on to the next story. I think we've probably said enough uh, in, in way of background on what's going on that I probably can move a little bit faster this next section, and I will try and keep it moving. So he went on from there and entered their synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand, and they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And so here Matthew says, so they might accuse him. In fact, all, all three Gospels say, so they might, might accuse him. So obviously here, this group of Pharisees are clearly the villains in the story. So I never said that all Pharisees were good. I just want you to realize that not all Pharisees are bad. He said to them, which one of you has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take a hold of it and lift it out? How much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So Jesus makes a conclusion there. In the other two Gospels, he asks the question, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or destroy it? Then back to Matthew. Um, then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out and it was restored healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. So he uses almost the same logic. Maybe it's a little simpler here. If, if rescuing a sheep is greater than the Sabbath, and a man is greater than a sheep, then rescuing a man or healing a man is greater than the Sabbath. So apparently no one raised any objection to the master's logic, but Mark indicates that maybe they were less than supportive as well because Jesus in verse five says, and he looked around them with anger, grieved at the hardness of their hearts and said to the man, stretch out your hand. So there was obviously, there's no work being done here. It's perfectly fine to stretch out your hand and Jesus didn't do any work, but, but he healed him. And I think what the uh, the deep state folks didn't like was that they were getting shown up and, and getting embarrassed. So um, stretching out your hand was not considered work. God definitely could answer prayer on the Sabbath. So I tend to suspect that they're after Jesus because of who he is and uh, not for what he did or on the particular day that he did it. So Matthew doesn't say what synagogue it was, but this is a picture of Chorazin. And it was located about two miles from Capernaum. And, and we just know it's a place Jesus did frequently. So uh, here's entering the synagogue. So we tend not to think of it today, but you know, sheep falling in a pit uh, could be a real concern depending on your, your society. And so often uh, today they will put um, covers or something over, over the pit to keep sheep or people from falling in. So here's a sheep taking a drink. And if that purple uh, cover wasn't there, maybe maybe the sheep would fall in. Um, one thing that's interesting is that uh, the Gospels don't come out and say that the disciples would have starved to death. So we've been using this analogy of a medical emergency overriding the rules of the Sabbath. But there's actually nothing to infer that. But uh, Jesus does declare that his disciples were guiltless of the infraction. So I'm comfortable that whatever their degree of hunger was, uh, it justified the, the Sabbath transgression. And, and that's good enough for me. So... Carrying that further, a sheep in a pit could be a life-threatening situation, but maybe it, maybe not. You know, um, some scribes say, "Well, just keep the sheep fed, and you know, go get it after the Sabbath." Well, that doesn't seem to make much sense. Just get the sheep out, um, get the sheep out immediately. So, basically, the general concept of rescuing the sheep to pre prevent its being scared or to prevent its suffering is permitted. So, therefore. Jesus is here extending this act of work on the Sabbath to any act of, of human compassion. So when he says the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath and the Sabbath was made for man, not the other way around, it's for man's benefit and man's enjoyment and anything that furthers that goal, even if it violates a technical requirement uh, of the Sabbath, um, then it's okay to do. So in closing, um, Lancaster concludes his chapter on this by saying, Jesus didn't come to break the Sabbath without justification. He didn't miraculously fix cracks in pottery, as was his example, because pots are not Lord of the Sabbath, right? Man is. Jesus came to restore a balanced perspective regarding Sabbath observance that prioritizes human need. Um, Jesus came to restore the Sabbath in the spirit in which God gave us. So as typical that Jesus does, he spells out you know kind of what the law says and then what but i say but i tell you this 
So the law says, you know, you can save a life on the Sabbath, but I say any act of compassion is okay on the Sabbath. So I guess in closing, my application question would be after this study, do, do you and I think that the picture of Jesus' behavior is consistent with someone who is quote unquote a Sabbath breaker? And then just ask yourself why or why not? So really the question is, did any of this that we dug into this week, that change your mind after looking at the scripture and um, and and do you have a more complete picture of Jesus and and what he was about and and kind of what his thought process was? I know after digging into this, I feel that I have a much better grasp. I didn't. I learned all this mostly this week, by the way. Um, so I have a, I have a much better grasp of what's going on with all of these Sabbath healings, and I hope that you do as well. So I'm going to close with a verse from Isaiah. And I'm just going to put it on the screen and, and leave it up for a while, and you can read it and kind of meditate on it. But that is what the spirit of what the Sabbath is about. And uh, thanks for watching this. I uh, hope it made sense. If not, you can go back and, and uh, watch, watch the stuff again. But uh, we will catch you next time.